So Keith, uh, your speech today about strategy was amazing. Uh, we have a lot of uh, partners in, uh, here at IT Nation that would like to know. They are not at the highest level. They are not the CEO. They may be uh, the service manager. They may be the sales manager. And they, they're looking at their company and they're saying, you're right, Keith, we don't have a proper strategic process running inside of our company. How do we influence those above us to get this strategic process running? So I can't tell you the number of times in a year I get a call from a middle manager who was one, in one of my meetings five years ago. And uh, you know, the meeting will have 50, 60 people in it, and I, often I don't, I don't even know everybody in the room, but I'll get a call and say, I was at your strategy session six years ago at XYZ Company. I'm now at this company. We really need to do what you're doing. How do, you, how do I get the attention of senior management to do that? And I can't tell you the number of clients I get from middle managers who move from one company to the next, and they, they get the attention of the CEO and say, you need to do something like this. I was in Boston a month ago, and I was with a company that Bain bought at a billion dollar valuation, and uh, I looked at the financials before I went to meet with the company, and if the company's worth 100 million, they're lucky in, in a stretch. And I got into this client because of a associate product manager who was in a meeting uh, at a, that I, for a company I, I worked with five years ago. And so uh, middle manager is one of the important parts of kind of believing in what kind of an organization you need to build is empowering the middle managers not just to do what they're told, but to get them involved in thinking through what the business should be. And this associate product manager got to the CEO and said, I have a process that can help us. And so, you know, I, I think there are a lot of middle managers are more are more powerful and more influential than they realize. Right. And I think I would add to that, uh, a lot of CEOs think that they own strategy. CEOs, if they think they own strategy, they are not the right CEO in the company. They are supposed to enlist strategy from you, uh, from the middle management team, from everyone in the company. And I think a lot of CEOs, just so you know, they, they really don't want the burden of all the strategy on their shoulders because they're just one brain. I mean, you get more brains involved, you're going to get a better strategy. And most importantly, when you get every, a lot of people involved in strategic thinking, you're going to get alignment in the company, and that's really the key. So uh, how do you go and talk to them about that? I think just say the things that we're talking about right here. You, you get them excited about this concept. You introduce it. You know, you say, hey, by the way, here's something that could help you. So I think that's a great question. Using your, your process, would you recommend that you can use it as a middle manager just within your microcosm with what you control? Absolutely. There's nothing more powerful than getting a bunch of people together in a room, sitting them around a table and saying, what is it we need to do here to get to the next level? What are the issues we need to address? What are the problems? And uh, you know that kind of that that kind of approach to leadership and management is infectious, and there's no reason why people can't every day think about this concept that the more minds you have working on a problem, the better the solution. If you get the process right, frankly, if somebody besides the leader of the subgroup can facilitate it, you're even better than somebody from without uh, from outside that department. People just tend to respond, I think, to facilitation. Where the interesting thing about human beings is. We defer to authority a lot more than, than you realize. Um, one of my favorite stories is how the Air Force was trying to figure out how um, navigators and pilots make decisions. And so they did this research where they put navigators and pilots in a room and they had them solve some kind of navigational problem. And what they found was that the, uh, the navigators were, def were, were deferring to the pilots even when the pilots were wrong. So they started sending the pilots in with stupider and stupider uh, uh, solutions to the problem <laughs> and they just still deferred. And so at the end of the, the experiment, the researchers met with the navigators and they said, so, you know, on, on question three here, you know, the pilot said X and you said Y, and it seems like there's a lot of logic to support your approach. And the navigators' responses were, um, well, yeah, but you don't understand how the military works. You know, those guys are selected from the best of the best. They have the best scores. They have a lot of training that we don't have. So my assumption was, you know, he just knew something that I didn't know. So that's why I deferred. Well, just substitute middle manager for navigator and vice president for pilot. And what you see is people defer when they shouldn't. And so teaching a group to not defer based on authority is really important. And the way you do that is you have sessions in which you as the leader change your mind right there in the room. Wow, I hadn't yeah, thought about that. Exactly. I'm changing my mind. You know, I think a point that you made too, uh, you know, you make a big point about insultants. 
you just also said, hey, it's, it's really great when you have someone from the outside facilitate. It is. I mean, when I worked at Pricewaterhouse as a technology consultant, it was amazing. I mean, I was fresh, fresh out of uh, the MBA program, 21 years old. But if you showed up and you were from out of town with a suit on and a briefcase, you had people that were 50, 60 years old deferring to me. Uh, it was kind of an amazing thing. And so you're right about people deferring to authority. And then the other side of that is, you know, forming a culture in your company of insultants. And I like the way that you came up with that phrase because insultants, uh, meaning consultants, like I just talked about, except being on the inside, inside the company, being a consultant, not being afraid to, to say, look, this isn't really the way we should do things. And I think that's fine. And I think the other side of insultants is you can say, this isn't how we should do it. Where a lot of people fail is they stop there. They don't say, and here's how we should do it, or here's some ideas that they have, I have, you know? Strongest way to be an insultant, in my opinion, and I'd like to hear what you think, is state the positive. State where you think the company should go as opposed to what we're doing wrong, and, and then champion that inside the company as an insultant. Uh, what's your thought about being an insultant? Because a lot of folks in our industry, service managers, sales managers, uh, you know, uh, HR managers, you know, they, they have ideas, they, they want to get them out there. Um, What's their best way to do that? So um, for me, creating a, a community of insultants is, is creating a place where people take a full swing at the issues. Uh, and they don't hedge what they say because they're afraid of you know, disagreeing with their vice president, saying something the CEO might not like. And so really creating an environment where people take a full swing at the issues. And that's why an, uh, a third party, it doesn't have to be an outside, but a third party facilitator is so important. So, you know, frankly, if the, uh, the sales group were having an offsite and the head of sales really wanted to get, usually salespeople are not shy about giving their opinion, so this may be not a good example, but really wanted to get underneath people's perceptions of what's wrong with the business. Maybe there's somebody in the marketing department that all the salespeople love and respect, respect the way the person thinks. So maybe you deputize that person and say, hey, you know, we're going to have a, a full-day meeting, and uh, I, as the VP of sales, I'm going to work with this marketing guy, and we're going to build an agenda, but the marketing guy is going to run the agenda, and his job is to make sure everybody in the room gets heard, uh, interesting uh, threads get pulled and followed, and I think, so I think that's a way to do it, is to, is to take the, uh, the senior executive out of the center of the room and put them on the periphery. We have all kinds of tricks we do with our company. So if you got you know 20 people in a department, you're doing a meeting, uh, I would put uh, five of them at each of four tables. I would ask a question. I would have each table work individually on that question. And then we'd put post-its on the wall based on the results of those four tables. So the VP of sales is going to be sitting at one of those four tables. You can pretty much bet that the conclusions of that table are going to agree with the VP of sales. But the other three tables aren't because he's not there or she's not there. She's not a part of the discussion. So that's when you really start to tease out where there's disagreement. And where there's disagreement, there's power, right? Because we can really start to figure out what the root of that uh, disagreement is. So using tricks like that where you move people around among the tables, you mix them up, you mix up different functional areas, you'll really start getting to the root cause of things. Right. Let me. Uh, you know what? It makes me think of something uh, because I know as, as the years that I've been a CEO, I've never thought that I'm the smartest guy in the room. In fact, I've always felt like, you know, you're not the smartest guy in the room, but your, your best asset is to listen and to get that information and those ideas from everyone else, and then your job is to kind of coordinate those. And I think that CEOs, like the one that you described on stage, Bill, who sort of pounds out the strategy and says, here it is, this is what we're gonna do, let's march to it. Honestly, I would say that those, those folks are not good CEOs. Uh, that kind of dictatorship, that kind of command uh, structure, I, I don't think that works. And especially, I, I feel that it's not working as we move into kind of a new era of management. Uh, and we have the new generation coming into the, to the workforce. I mean, that's, that's very 50s, right? Yeah. Uh, and well, everybody points to the success stories because there are exceptions. So Larry Ellison is known to be that kind of guy. Absolutely. And he's been very successful. And no longer CEO of Oracle. Exactly. But, right? for, but for all the years he ran Oracle, I think people would argue that that was his style. I, it and was. when people bring that up, I say, are you Larry Ellison? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and most well, people I mean, have to say, no, I'm not. Steve Ballmer is another great yep. example of that. You know, and, Steve and Jobs. 
Steve Jobs was a good example yeah. of that, you know. But so, I mean, you know, if you look at what Balmer's track record was, it's like he, you know, he was that worked for Microsoft in the early years, and that almost put Microsoft into a, a massive uh, freefall decline towards the end of his reign at Microsoft. And so you see, like a guy like uh, Sajai Natala who's come in at Microsoft and he's got a very different approach. It's very open, it's very collective, it's very, let me get the best ideas in the company, and he coordinates those. And you see what Microsoft's doing now, it's just amazing. So I think this, this is something that if you're, if you're working for a company where you've got a CEO uh, that is a dictator, try to influence them. Um, and, and by the way, this process, so that's what I was trying to say on the stage, is that, um, a lot of people are dictators because they think that's what they're supposed to exactly. be. Exactly. And so it's amazing how getting a CEO to embrace a adaptive strategy process that involves a lot of people, it these are smart people. It takes them about a half an hour to, most of them to sit back and say, wow, this is pretty powerful. And what I find is very driven, you know, kind of alpha, uh, I'm my way or the highway type people are often some of the best clients I have because that it's something completely new to them and they see the power right away and they end up sitting. Now I have a CEO who's running a two and a half billion dollar company and he never says, we, we have a three day meeting. He didn't say a word until the last half hour. Right. He, his, 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 my job here is to let the process work. And, and if I see us going off the rails, I'm going to stand up and say it, but I've built a company of smart people. We don't go off the rail very often. Yeah. If we do, I'll stand up and say, I think we're going off the rails here. Yeah, I, I agree with that. And I, I'd say that I fit that category. So, you know, a, as a CEO, what do you, you know, you read, what is a CEO supposed to do? A CEO is supposed to set strategy. That's a little bit off. I think that they're supposed to facilitate strategy. Uh, and I think that the processes that we're talking about have that twist to it. In other words, allowing the strategy to bubble up from within the amazing brains and minds and collective knowledge of the people inside of the company and then facilitating it and coordinating it and driving it once it's established. So establishing strategy uh, is something that you need to farm from the entire company. Uh, now, it was an interesting process for me because I have run ConnectWise for, gosh, 30 plus years now. Uh, with the misconception that that's what a CEO should do. And so this last year, I actually said, you're not going to set the strategy. For 2016, you're not going to. You, you, and I wrote down the 15 things I thought the company should do. Uh, and I said, well, let's see if, if, if they think it's the things that the company should do. And it was an amazing process because we got everybody in the room. We got the senior leadership team in a room. We went through this StratOps process where we kind of farmed the ideas uh, out of their brains. The strategy was, out of the 15 things I had, 10 of them were the same, uh, five of them were different, the five they came up with were better than the five I had on my list, yeah. and it was like, I don't, I don't have to do this anymore. It was liberating for me as a CEO to say, this is better. The company's this living, breathing organism that actually can be self-guided missile, and I, that's what I think is the most powerful yeah, thing about it's it. It's a great metaphor. Business growth, uh, we all strive for rapid business growth, more money, bigger companies, things like that. Every once in a while it gets out of control, all right? And you have to rein it in. Where are the, where are the danger points? Where do you have to say, whoa, we're growing too fast, too big, and we all want to be there, but it gets to a point where you've got to be very careful about it. So to free, rephrase that, would it be, uh, even when a company has had success and is having success and they're growing very fast, what should the strategy be in that case? Because it can also be a dangerous thing? Correct. Okay. So. So, um, so the, the idea of growth is, is really an interesting one. Because, you know, I meet people who say, well, my, I don't want to grow my business. I like it. It's a lifestyle business. It's good. And, and unfortunately, I just disagree that there are very many businesses that you can do that with. If you're the only employee, it works great. But the minute you have an employee, I believe in every human being is the desire to climb mountains and accomplish things and to be transformed by the experience. Uh, there, there are probably people who are happy laying on the couch. I don't really think they're happy. I think inside every human being you know, is the, is the desire to go conquer something new, learn something new, be something new. And so the problem with people who say, I don't want to grow, uh, I like things the way they are, is 
they're running a business of people who may not feel like that and who probably don't feel like that. Good Everybody point. wants to be a part of something bigger than themselves and they want to be a part of something going somewhere. That is the human spirit. We need to go somewhere. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. on, the, on the one end of the spectrum, I think it's important to grow. And I think, it's, I think you're either growing or dying as an organization. That's the deal. Because the minute you don't grow, there aren't new promotions, there aren't new jobs, there aren't new markets. The business is not creating opportunity for human beings. And that's, to me, what a business is all about. But you can, you can go off the other side, and, and that is you can grow too fast. And frankly, more companies fail from growing too fast than growing too slow. It's, it's one of the biggest dangers for a business's life. And I know that because I studied the Inc. 500 companies for 25 years. I studied 25 years of results, and a lot of them don't exist anymore mm -hmm. because they were really fast-growing companies that blew up. So it's a great question. Mm -hmm. So how do you know what is the right, uh, what is the right speed? Well, I work with companies that grow really fast. And so my interest is, well, how do we structure these companies in such a way that they can grow as fast as, as they need to? Because take my own business. I'm a small businessman. I got a couple of partners. But the reason I grow, so, so my wife has a rule. I'm not allowed to travel more than 100 days a year, okay? So guess how many years I've traveled for the last 10 years? Exactly 100, right? Why not 98? Well, because I'll get a phone call and somebody will say, I'm, I've got this business and I need your help. And I can't resist the desire to help somebody. And I happen to believe that what we do is very special and we take a lot of pride in what we do. And so I've traveled 100 days a year because that's the amount that my wife says I can travel without getting a divorce. Um, so do I, do, I, do I travel 100 days a year because of the money? I don't do it for the money. I do it because... I like to be engaged in helping people do what they're trying to do, A. And B, I feel like it wouldn't be prudent for me to not answer the phone and agree to go help people if I have time in that, in that band. So I think companies that say, wow, I can make a lot more money if I grow the business, those are the ones that get into trouble. Yeah. And the companies that are really engaged in the business of creating meaning for their customers and meaning for their employees, they know, how to, they know how to manage that growth line, right? And they don't get so upset if they have a year where they only grow 5%, and they don't get too full of themselves if they have a year when they grow 35%. They're trying to manage the business in terms of how do we optimize the good we do for our customers and the good we do for our employees. And I think if you're motivated by those measures, you don't have to worry about growing too fast. Uh, but most of the companies that I work with they have so much fun doing what they're doing. They believe so much in what they do for customers, for employees. They really do want to grow as fast as they can because they're creating opportunities on both sides. Excellent. Good. I think I'll from a customer's perspective, can enterprise have a great culture when it comes to the people? Um, probably one in four of the hires that we make, I don't think fit our organization in terms of culture. How, how do you test for that? Okay, so, you know, Appreciate that, number one. I think ConnectWise does have an amazing culture. Um, the answer is we hire for culture. Um, and I said that earlier. I said, you know, you must be willing to hire and fire based on culture. So, you know, you could have a, you know, you could have a kid coming out of college that's got a 4.0 that, you know, is just as good, you know, as intelligent as, as all get out and can be a superstar, uh, but they may not fit you culturally. So you got to pass on those. Uh, you have to hire people that you think are going to be a good culture fit. And more importantly, when someone is not and you discover they're not a good culture fit, you have to fire them. Now, the way I like to think about that is a garden. I mean, a garden's always, you know, you've got to always be weeding a garden, right? You've got to fertilize the garden. You know, you want the flowers to grow in there. You've got to water it. You know, they need, it needs sunshine, you know, and those are your people. Those are your flowers. I mean, you've got to be pulling the weeds out. Uh, that so they don't choke the flowers out. You've got to be providing plenty of water. That's a great example of good culture where you're you're giving them praise and you're giving them you know recognition for the things that they're doing. Great. You got to give them fertilizer. You got to give them the opportunity to grow and 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 uh, uh, find new opportunities inside the company. And that's why the company does have to be growing because it needs fertilizer. Right. These things have to have an opportunity to grow. But you're trying to keep out. The only thing you want to plant is there is the, are the flowers that you want in there. And when you figure out that's not what you want, or in fact you put a weed in there, it, it's got to go. Culture sustains itself once there is enough of it, right? 
Uh, and we know this from science, right? I mean, and you, you get a culture growing in a Petri dish. Once it, there's enough colonies of that culture in that Petri dish, you're good. It'll take over the whole dish, right? Uh, but if you get some foreign antibody or some foreign uh, uh, agent inside of that experiment, it could destroy it. And so that's, that's really how I see culture. You, you have to, you, and you have to be on top of that. And the CEO has to own culture. Uh, and a lot of CEOs don't understand culture. So I try to use that analogy to make it simple, but CEOs, you know, culture isn't getting up, you know, every month and, and having a rah-rah meeting. Culture is about, you know, treating people like human beings, treating them like a family. And I think the reason that you see ConnectWise has such a strong culture is because it started with David and I in a spare bedroom in our parents' house. And it was a family event. It was a family affair. And so every single colleague that we've added to the company, we've always added that as an extension of our family and then treated them like family. And so, uh, and then I guess I would, th I would say to all of you who have children, think about the culture you want inside of your own family. You know what you want. You want a loving, caring culture that nurtures uh, the children, that nurtures each other, where you feel a rewarding sensation from from watching them grow and watching them achieve new things and learn new things. There is no difference in a company. So the best analogy that you have for building culture in your company is exactly your family, exactly what you want for your family. So we, we are a very, very small company. There's four of us. And I was very intrigued by your a lot of the ideas that you had in your presentation today. I'm wondering what ideas and tips you have that we could take that would even scale it down more to someone our size. So sitting around a table, one, if you're a, a company of four people, you will probably spend 50% of your time with the business running you and the other 50% of your time running the business. And as you scale up, you'll be able to decrease the amount of time the business is running you and you'll be able to increase the amount of time you're running the business. And you'll scale up a little bit better and you'll go from running the business to improving the business. And then at some point, you'll get to the point where you can really spend time building the business. And building the business is thinking about, you know, kind of uh, drawing the blueprint of where you want to go. And so even in a company with four people, I would say, what would be the harm of creating a ritual where once a quarter, you sit around a table, you get yourself away from putting out fires, away from running the business, and you say, what are we building here? What are the next steps for us in what we're building here? Uh, and how do we? How would we like to see our business change in the next quarter, uh, and the next year? And I think this is something you could do informally. And frankly, great teams, great entrepreneurial founder teams, they do this. They they have rituals to where every periodically, once a month, once a quarter, whatever, they sit down around a table away from work and they talk about what is it we're doing here, what is it we're building here. And I think that can start really early. I think it's, it can start with four people, and I think it can be a profound and powerful discipline and a ritual. And frankly, it'll help you keep hope as you're in this stage where 50% of your time, the business is running you. Great question. Great answer. Okay, so I have a question. Yeah. I love your book, Bounce. Uh, I don't think it's for bad times. I think that, as you mentioned in the book, Every company goes through cycles, uh, and there's that up cycle, and then there's that down cycle. And this is sort of the natural rhythm of all of life, if you think about it. Um, I have read your book, Bounce, four times. Um, probably the most significant time that I read it was had nothing to do with business. I had just attempted to swim the English Channel. I got four miles from the coast of France. I had to bail because I was going into hypothermia. And I got back on the boat and I wrote a couple notes down. Here's what you did wrong, Arnie. Bam, bam, bam. 20 things. Last thing I put on there was read Bounce again. <laughs> and the reason was because, you know, it, it's a way of rejuvenating. It's a way of, of, of hitting the bottom and then bouncing back up from the bottom. Uh, and I think just that concept and the, and the word bounce is such an incredible metaphor because I mean, in, in the book you mentioned, you know, uh, everyone's going to hit the bottom from time to time. And when you hit the bottom, and, you know, it was just the English Channel. It wasn't my life. It wasn't my business. But it was a major goal in my life that I wanted to accomplish. And I wanted to say, 
you're not going to give up. You're going to come back. So when I hit the bottom, you know, I love your analogy of are you a, are you an, a Christmas ornament where when you hit, you're going to shatter? Are you an orange where you're going to hit and you're just going to thud? Or are you a, a rubber ball where you're going to hit and you're going to bounce back stronger? Uh, so what are the things that you think companies can do to make sure that they're that hard rubber ball instead of the orange or the Christmas ornament? How do they bounce back? Uh, can you give us some ideas on that? So the book is about resilience. And you're right, resilience is not something you call upon just in the bad times. But re resilience, I think, is maybe the most important human quality. I don't know if any of you ever done this, but when we had our first child, my wife and I sat down and we're maybe a little bit like you in this, we're kind of explicit in what we do. So we created a notebook of the the kind of home we wanted to create and the kind of qualities we wanted to see emerge from our kids. And one of the most, one of the first words we wrote was resilience. My other favorite one is gratitude. I think gratitude and resilience are, you can probably take those two qualities in a human being and they could do anything. And so resilience is really, uh, it's defined as uh, a system's ability to reorganize itself when it hits a, uh, a challenge. And that's what we want our kids to be able to do, right? We don't want our kids to be so fragile that the first time they flunk a test or the first time something happens to them, they fall apart. We want them to bounce back. One of my favorite stories, my son was not athletic at all. And in seventh grade, I, I talked him into taking a tennis class and he loved it. And gets to high school and he's trying out for the varsity team and he uh, and he gets his clock cleaned by a kid who's just a natural athlete he's been he plays tennis every day three hours a day studying and this kid who's a natural athlete kind of beats him out for his spot on the team in the in the first thing and so there's going to be two other matches and so it's it's nine o'clock at night I picked him up and this kid has just taken his spot on the varsity team and he's crying he's in my car crying he's 13 years old 14 years old and we're driving home, and I said, so, you know, what's going on? He said, well, so Xander beat me out from my spot. I said, okay, well, what do you want to do? He said, I want to quit tennis. And I, I, something told me, don't say a word, just, you know, just drive. So I'm driving the car. He says, I want to quit tennis. And we drive for about two minutes. He said, turn the car around. I said, where are we going? He said, to the club. I'm going to hit balls. And he went, and he hit balls till midnight. Uh, with the ball machine and you know to me I, and I just made me so happy I said wow this kid at 13 year old has the wisdom of resilience Stanley McChrystal you know who ran our uh, operations in in Iraq for a long time he he likes to talk about the difference between a robust system and a resilient system so the people who built the, built the pyramids were amazing architects because these structures have lasted thousands of years against wind and rain and all kinds of weather they're very robust structures but you drop a bomb right in the middle of a, of a pyramid, it ain't putting itself back together. It's broken, it's gonna stay broken. Uh, a coral reef, on the other hand, a, um, a, a hurricane sweeps through a coral reef, and unless a certain percentage of it is destroyed, that coral reef, left to its own devices, will rebuild itself. That's what we're trying to build in companies. We're trying to build the, the ability to kind of remake itself as it encounters challenges, which are a part of human life and a part of business life especially. And so um, I think a lot about what makes resilient people and what makes resilient companies. And I think this idea of beginning to see life as a series of disintegrations and reintegrations really helps me. Because when I have to go through a disintegration, the first thing I'll tell myself is, oh, this is how I grow. I'm, I'm in a growth mode right now. And frankly, we are sleepwalking most of our lives in human life and most of business life. We're sleepwalking. We're kind of putting a quarter in in business and we're getting 35 cents out. And if we keep doing that, everything's good. It's when something in the environment changes that causes us to have to question our assumption, then we're really fully alive. And so what I suggest companies do, leaders do, manufacture those times. Manufacture those times when companies look at themselves even before things get really bad. And what will happen is you'll teach an organization that life is disintegrating and reintegrating. And all of a sudden, when you go through a disintegration, everyone's not going to be panicking. They're going to be saying, oh, we've seen this before. We do this a lot. This is kind of how we, this is kind of how we are. So that's, to me, the message of balance is 
is how do we become more resilient? Beautiful. I think it's, uh, it's been very useful to me, not only, and by the way, uh, read the book, went back in 2013, made it across the English Channel. I did. I bounced back. Congratulations. Uh, but it's been so useful uh, running ConnectWise. Um, you know, we just reorganized the entire company. We just merged, you know, three companies into one. And uh, the company needed to bounce, you know, because I just, that's a natural disintegration when you're making that much change. And, yep. and, and I think the, the key is, too, is like, you know, as, as you're heading down uh, and as the company's heading down, the whole question is, you know, there's change and we don't know what to do about it, which causes massive anxiety. Uh, and I think that the key that you've brought up is as you see these things happening, the job of, of a CEO is to absorb that anxiety. And, and I like to use the analogy, or I like to use the story of uh, Saving Private Ryan. I mean, there's a great scene in that, yeah. in that movie, and I think you mentioned it in your book. Yep. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's, it's Tom Hanks, who is the sergeant, and they've just gone through a, a hell fight. And they're walking up a hill, and his whole platoon's standing behind him, and they're you know, walking up the hill with him, and they're complaining about this, they're complaining about that. And, and one of them reaches out to, you know, the sergeant goes, Sarge, but you never complain. Why don't you complain? And he says, you know what? My job is to absorb your complaints. You complain to me. I complain to the major. He complains to the general. Gripes flow up the chain of command and never down. Yeah. And I have used that inside of ConnectWise and my company so many times to tell people, it's like, look, your job as a manager is to absorb all of the anxiety of the people below you. You can't reflect it back down. You can't push it out to the managers that are parallel to you. Your job is to absorb it, and it's, you don't have to hold it there. You can take it to the person that you report to, who can take it to the person that they report to, uh, and it eventually ends up on the CEO's desk. And once it goes to the CEO's desk, I mean, hopefully the CEO has big enough shoulders where they can absorb all of that and put a plan in place so that the change happens. And, and that's really the key is when you hit that bottom, right, in your book, it's like you have to have that plan. And once people understand there's a plan, oh my God, we don't have to be afraid. There's a plan that we'll, when we, when we, 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 we invoke this plan, we're gonna, we're gonna come back. And so you take that anxiety of, you know, as people are descending and, and they see bad things happening in the company, it's like, what are we gonna do? Everything's changing, oh my God, life's gonna end whoa, we have a plan, and we bounce back with this plan, and now we change the anxiety from we don't know what's going to happen to let's see how quickly we can uh, uh, invoke this plan, this change plan, and, and bounce back. And, and I've seen it. It's just it's a process. It's a mechanical, and you've described it perfectly in your book. And I think so many people uh, need to read that book. Uh, I know you wrote it because of uh, the 2008 kind of crash, yeah. but, but it's a natural cycle just like the seasons and every company goes through it and every marriage goes through it and every relationship goes through it and so I think it's a very powerful book and the message is, is beautifully delivered. Well, you'll love this story about the book. I, I always have, you know, 10 or 20 CEOs when I write a book, I send it to them, the people I respect, and I say, give me your honest comments. And after I wrote Bounce, I got a call from Kerry Chesek, who was at the time running Restaurant.com, one of the most creative CEOs I've ever worked with him. And he, uh, he said, you know, I love this book. I want to buy 500 copies of this book. You've got to make one change for me. Please just make one change. I said, well, what is it? He said, I hate the language you use, the central language of the book, this disintegration and reintegration. He said, disintegration sounds too negative. He says, you need to find a more positive word. He says, because I want to buy this book for every employee of our company, and I can't, like, get up in front of them all and say, let's go disintegrate. And he said, I feel really strongly about this. Please think about this. And so I hung up the phone, and I spent a couple of days, because I respect him, and I like him, and I asked, his, I asked his input. So I thought about it for a couple of days, and I called him back, and I said, well, Carrie, I'm going to essentially uh, cancel a 500-book order here. I said, because I can't do it. I said, a really important part of the message of this book is it is not fun mm -hmm. when you're going through it. Right. It is painful. It mm -hmm. does cause anxiety. There's no such thing as recreational disintegration. No. But it is a vital part of life. And uh, the, the tool we have here is our point of view as we're facing challenges. And it's very important that we not sugarcoat it. It's painful. Mm -hmm. It's ugly. 
-hmm. Nobody wants to go through it. Mm -hmm. And we're probably not going to force ourselves to disintegrate important, in important ways. The world will still make, make us do that. Mm -hmm. But if we can at least make friends with the experience and keep some sense of perspective when we're going through it, and we can absorb the anxiety of people around us who count on us to lead them, then, you know, it will, it will make us great. I don't believe companies are made during the great times. I think, I think companies get lazy during the good times. Companies are made during the tough times. So every time you go through a tough time in your business, say to yourself, oh, this is my opportunity. We're actually going to get better now. Mm -hmm. It's a shame to waste a good bounce. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> As you say in your book. Other questions? I'm just going to put a statement out there and see what kind of reaction I get. You both seem to be having far too much fun to retire. Who said anything about retiring? <laughs> <laughs> well, I suspect I'm going to be 60 this year, which is a big number. And, uh, you know, so, you know, I don't work for the money anymore. I'm fine financially. So, you know, my wife, who likes to see me, actually, and probably doesn't love the fact that I travel 100 days a year, you know, once a year we sit down as a family and we talk about what do we want for next year. And, you know, every year I think about stopping doing what I'm doing. But, um, you know, um, I'll tell a story. So when I was young, I used to, I, I had big dreams for myself when I was young. And so I was a stalker. Uh, uh, and what I mean by this is I would find people who had written things or who had done things who I felt like I could really learn from them, and I would figure out a way to get them into my life so I could just ask them a couple of key questions. And you know, you probably do this with authors, right? In terms of one of the reasons you do these whole Being events, right now. Yeah, one of these reasons you do these events because you get to meet the people who've written things right? that you care. Well, yeah. so I did that yeah. when I was younger. Absolutely. And uh, so I, I, one of the guys I got fascinated with uh, uh, in my early life was a guy named Norman Cousins. He was uh, editor of the uh, Saturday Evening Post or Review, something, when he was younger. He wrote a bunch of books on Albert Schweitzer, who to me is a really interesting guy. And uh, then he got terminally ill, and he wrote a book called Human Options. And it, it was a story of how him trying to heal himself with you know, positive thinking. So he's just a fascinating guy. So I was a, a business school dean at the time, and I engineered this event that he was going to speak at purely for the purpose of getting to meet the guy and kind of figure out what he was all about. And uh, so we, uh, he said, okay, I want to go speak to this group of CEOs you have. I said, okay, well, I need to meet with you one-on-one -on -one to kind of walk you through and kind of talk about, you know, what you're going to talk about. And he said, okay, fine, come up to my house for lunch. He lived up at the top of Mulholland Drive in Los Angeles. Drove up to his house, and uh, he answers the door. He's on the phone, and this is before, like, cordless phones. He has this long cord all the way back to his <laughs> kitchen. It's like probably a 30-foot <laughs> phone cord. Goes, Which sorry. was high tech at the time. Exactly. He says, I'm sorry, I'm on a phone. He brings me into his kitchen. I sit at a linoleum table. He gives me a glass of water and he walks into the other room and he has a conversation with somebody. I can't hear what he's saying. And he comes back in and says, Oh, I'm sorry. And before he even sits down, the phone rings again. And, uh, you know, he goes back and gets on the phone. This goes on for an hour. I'm at his house sitting at his kitchen table during lunch with a glass of water in front of me. And every time the guy starts to come back, the phone rings and he goes somewhere else. So finally, after about an hour, he comes, he said, I'm sorry. He said, I got to apologize. He said, we intended to spend the hour talking about your event and, you know, my speech for that. He says, but I don't know if you know this, but, you know, I almost died about eight years ago. And next to me is all of his books because I want him to sign all my books. I said, I pulled out Human Options. He says, yeah, I know the story. I read the book. He goes, one of the promises I made to the universe was that if I lived from this disease that was supposed to kill me, I would make myself available to anybody in the world who has just gotten that comment from their doctor, you're not going to make it, because I want to talk to that person. Because I want to be one person who says, I was where you were, and don't necessarily believe it. And he said, so doctors all over the world have my phone number. And they know that if they have somebody who's having a hard time with the message they just referred, they give them my card, and they call me. And he said, so that's what those calls are. He says, there's a certain time of the day, every day, where I'm available for that. So, you know, I... All the time he was doing this, I'm mad at him, right? I'm saying, this guy is not, he's not talking to me. He's disrespecting me. And then I realized that I've just been in the presence of some, one of the most amazing people on earth because of the donation he, of his time he's given to people struggling with a new terminal diagnosis. And so I'm sitting there feeling really embarrassed and ashamed by the fact that I was ready to strangle the guy for leaving me sitting at the kitchen table. I knew I had like two minutes left. 
I said, okay, let me just ask you one question. I said, what does a person need to be happy? That was like the only question I could think of, you know. That, and he said, oh, that's easy. He said, we won't need two minutes for that. He said, someone to love, something meaningful to do, and something to believe in. He says, if you have all three of those things, you will be happy. He says, if you have one missing, you might be happy. And if you have two missing, it's really unfortunate. And I walked out of that house saying, the guy's probably given me one of the best gifts. It was worth stalking this guy. Because now my whole life is oriented around these things. Do you believe in something? Do you have something meaningful to do? And do you, do you, and do you love someone? Or do you love something? And so retirement to me is a meaningless concept. Because I every day go to work with a client who's struggling with an issue. Half of the people in the room are convinced it's going to crash their company. For them, it's a huge thing. And I'm an outsider. And I can come in and say, I've seen 100 companies face this kind of challenge and bigger, and you people will figure it out. I love that. In other words, you will not die. Right. I love those people. I love doing that. It's something I believe in. And so who would ever retire doing something like that? Well, I have guys running IT service companies who feel the same way about their businesses, right? They, you know, they, they, they manage services for their clients in a way that changes their client's life. They're, they have a partner they can trust. And so the idea of retirement is, is, is meaningless if you're doing something you believe in. What you find to do is meaningful, and you have relationships of love with the people you're doing it. That's my Excellent. cut on retirement. Excellent. So when you go into a company, uh, Keith, uh, and you put your strategy process in place, what kinds of financial results do you often see? So... It depends on what table you're at. So I have a, one of my favorite clients. I had dinner with him last week in San Francisco. Is a guy who runs a cardboard box company in Modesto, California, in an industry where all of the value profit has been sucked out of the fabrication chain and the value chain, and the paper mills make all the money. And there are you know eight big paper mill companies in America, and they all essentially set the price of paper and they all have fabrication divisions who make boxes for customers and they're willing to lose money in the fabrication just to pull paper out of their mills. Does that make sense? So how'd you like to be a guy who only makes boxes and doesn't, isn't owned by a paper mill? It's terrible because your competitors will sell at cost or below cost. And this guy's one of the most fabulous business people I've ever met. They have revenues of 170 million. They're one of the real players, the, the, probably the biggest independent paper box company in America. And he and I talk all the time, and we laugh all the time, because uh, he's at the nickel table. Uh, it, it, it is brutal trying to, to, uh, to even make a penny of profit in that business. And yet he's built this army of unbelievably capable, driven, happy, competitive people. And they have built this company where you know, they got $170 million in revenue, and they make money. He just invested $70 million in plant and equipment. He does that every two or three years for a $170 million business. He, he plays the cards he was given. He's in the box company, and he is going to make money. He's going to create a career path for his employees, and he's going to win, but he's playing at the nickel table. I have another client who, you know, whose revenues were about a half a billion dollars uh, five years ago, and it's two and a half billion today, and... Uh, uh, his, you know, he just bought a, he just built a brand new G450, uh, which is a really nice Gulfstream uh, jet. Uh, he's at the $100 table, right? And so uh, we have had financial res results, the whole spectrum of the business environment, because in some businesses, uh, you make a lot of money. In some businesses, you don't make a lot of money. Interestingly enough, companies who are who are focused on their business out of prudence for their employees and their customers almost always make above average returns for their industry, right? But some of those industries are wildly attractive and some not. Uh, but companies that, that say, I'm going to run my business in the most prudent way possible for my customers and my employees, they almost always earn above average returns for their market. And I'll add to that, um, I think companies that execute strategy the right way, understand strategy, and then have a renewable strategy process that is connected to execution and operations, basically, you can do whatever you want with your profits. If you decide 
you, you've created an engine to do whatever you want with your company. Um, I've seen those companies have wild profits, but I've also seen those companies say, we're, we're going to pour all those profits back into the strategies that we've just come up with because we think we can grow even more. So I guess my answer would be, you will not find a company moving at a fast pace or being in sync uh, and accomplishing many goals unless they are all aligned with their strategy and is, unless they are also renewing the strategy. And I think that, you know, here's the amazing thing. I mean, every time I've studied or read any business book where it's been a great strategy book, they always go back to an analogy in the military. Why is that? And I think the answer is because in the military, it, it's not about making money. It's about staying alive. Uh, it's about saving lives. And it's about staying alive. Uh, and so it's so important. You cannot shortchange strategy in military operations. And you cannot afford to say, hey, look, we're going to fail fast and, and, and we'll, we'll learn from our mistakes. And you can also not ever have a mission and not uh, review that mission and say, what did we learn? What can we do better? And it, because life and death are on the line, it forces a mental focus that creates strategy. And I think that we need to learn that and sort of maybe look at our business that way because in, a, in many ways your business is life or death. It's certainly the life or death of the families that are relying on your business to survive. Uh, you know, at ConnectWise, we have 900 families that rely on us. Uh, so I don't look at it as 900 employees. We've even banned the term employee. You're only a colleague. You're a colleague because we work shoulder to shoulder. But those are families. That's 900 families. And so for me, it is life or death. And, and I think that that really is something that drives us. And I think it's a better way of looking at your company. Well, it is life or death. So when I managed this company that got into real trouble back in 1997, we had to, um, in order to survive, we had to lay off, um, we had 360 employees when I took over as CEO, and we had 90 employees 60 days later. Oh, yeah, I read that. And, and the wife of one of our employees uh, jumped off a freeway overpass mm. after we laid off her husband. So. Mm. It is really, really uh, life or death in terms of us being prudent. And you know, I, I went through that experience, and while I, I don't think I or the management team can take responsibility for that tragedy, I tell you, I, I just managed my businesses after that in a way that just I realized how important it is mm -hmm. because people <coughs> count on us. In the Middle Ages, the church was the center of human life. It was the center of society. Well, what's the center of human society today? It's, it's our work, it's right? It's someone to love, something meaningful to do, and something to believe in. Well, something meaningful to do has become the center of our culture. And so we have a sacred responsibility to the people in our companies, I think, to run them to the best of our ability. Amen. I think that's a great place to stop. What do you think? Yes. All right. Excellent, Keith. Thank you so much. Good stuff. Good seeing you again. <laughs>